Kai posto tin kof kavri and the shame Christ for the day that for you and me he suffered all to take our sins away Oh, the pain he must have suffered all because he loved me so how can I do less than serve him as each day to life I go
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another great opportunity to come together to study your word. Thank you for your spirit, always enlightening us and teaching us, leading us into the depth of the knowledge of the word of God. We pray that as we come together today, your spirit will still continue to teach every one of us in Jesus' name. And we pray that your spirit will take these things we learn and make them to be worked out in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We pray that the study of the word will benefit and profit every one of us. That will draw us closer and nearer in fellowship and intimacy with you. Thank you for the answer, O Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are coming to the end of uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. This is the 51st study, and we're looking at two verses today. Hopefully, in another study, which will be the 52nd study, we'll be able to finish the epistle. And it's very instructive as we look at the close of the epistle. As we look at verses 20 and 21, it reads, Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You will see that these two verses that form the text of our story today is actually a prayer that the apostle prayed for the readers and the hearers of the teachings of the epistle. He's been talking of the new covenant, and he's shown us that the new covenant is greater and richer and better and higher than the old covenant. And he's giving some exhortations and commandments all through the epistle. And as he closes, he wants to remind us that without the power of God, the enablement of God, all we have studied in the epistle, we will not be able to do. And so, as he's coming to the conclusion of the epistle, there is something that he found necessary, and that is prayer. And he's saying, may the God of peace, who has given us this new covenant, through the blood of that new covenant, the everlasting covenant, do a particular work in you. Make you perfect. There's another thing we learn as we look at these two verses. You will notice in the verses we studied last week, he was asking that the readers and the hearers will pray for him. Look at verse 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that is to pray for me, so that I may be restored unto you the sooner. You see, he's been asking for the church, the believers, to pray for him. He now demonstrates something. What he was asking the members of the church to do for him, he was willing to do for them as well. And now he goes on to pray for the people. What a lesson for those who are preachers. What a lesson for those who are leaders in the church of, of the living God. We must practice what we preach. What we request from the church to do towards us, we must also do towards the church. As ministers desire the prayers of their people, let them see to it that they are not slack in praying for those that God has committed to their church. And here we see what he was praying for. He was praying that God might uh, work and produce in these uh, people what he had taught in general in the epistle and what he had taught he had demanded in particular in this chapter. There is a lesson here. It is not enough to preach faithfully the word of God. The preacher must also faithfully and fervently and frequently ask God to bless that word unto those who have heard and those who have listened to the word so that their hearts and lives will be transformed. For those of us who have the privilege of leading in the church, we need to understand that our duty is not only to preach, our responsibility is also to pray for those who are hearing the word of God. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 23 tells us that if we fail to do that, then we have not completed our duty. None of us shall think we have preached. 
We have given the word. We have done all we could do. We have not finished. We still need to take the hearers of the word to the Lord in prayer. First Samuel chapter 12 and in verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Here Samuel, the leader of the people at that time, a prophet, he said, I will teach you. There is a teaching of the word. There is a preaching of the word. But then he said, if I stopped there, I'll be sinning against the Lord. I must not sin. I must not stop praying for you. And so we learn from the apostle here in Hebrews chapter 13 that he had to pray for the people so that the Lord will produce the right results in their lives after hearing the word. Come back to Hebrews chapter 13. The apostle's prayer is to the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. The prayer was directed to God that God will do something and in effect something in their hearts. And you know what he was praying for? He was praying, may this God of peace make you perfect in every work to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. If you look at the prayer, it's so high. He wanted the perfection of the people. But he had no problem. He had no fear that God will fulfill what he was praying for. Why? Because that God had manifested his power. He raised up Jesus from the dead. And if God could do that, there is nothing else he cannot do. The question is, will God do that for the generations of believers today? Or could he only do it for the people at that time? He's going to do it for the people today because he's doing it through the blood of the ever everlasting covenant. As long as that covenant is everlasting, the generations and generations of believers can study this and believe that the Lord will do it for them. And what are the things we see in uh, the two verses we're looking at that the apostle was praying about? There are three points we're going to consider in the study. Number one, peace with God. Peace with God. Number two, the peace of God. And then number three, perfection and godliness. Let's look at number one. In number one, we're looking at peace with God. In verse 20, Hebrews 13, verse 20, May the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, and so on. The emphasis we want to have in this point one is to look at God and look at the title by which God is called. You will realize that he called, Paul the Apostle called him the God of peace. And you realize that he's making a, a request here and he's a giving a petition before the Lord. And he refers to this God as the God of peace. He could refer to God in some other ways. He could have called him the God of power. He could have called him the God of all grace. He could have called him the God that is holy. He could have called him the God of glory. But here, he called him the God of peace. You realize something? As you look at the whole epistle, you have been studying the sacrifices of the old covenant. You have been looking at the shedding of blood in the old covenant. And he's telling us that the blood of the new covenant is uh, higher and greater than the blood of the old covenant. What is the central thing? That the blood of the new covenant has done between humanity and almighty God. Reconciliation we what enmity against the Lord. Because the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans chapter 1 and in verse 18 tells us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. In the Old Testament, Psalm 5 verse 5 we are told that God hates all workers of iniquity. And in Psalm 7 verse 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. In fact, we are told in Isaiah chapter 63 and in verse 10, but they rebelled and they vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. And then we are told in Isaiah 48 and verse 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. But then, Paul the Apostle had been tracing the effect and the influence and the power of the blood of the Old Testament sacrifices and then he has told us of the blood of the new covenant. What do you think then he's going to talk about? He's going to talk about reconciliation. 
is going to talk about peace. The peace we have with God as a result of the blood that was shed on our behalf. That is why he says, the God of peace. And that God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus. What did he mean by bringing again? Our Lord Jesus, a sacrifice for us. He became our substitute. He took our sins away. And then for the Lord to say, I've accepted the sacrifice and everything is okay before me. It's a perfect sacrifice. He raised him from the dead to show his approval, appreciation of what he had done. And then he becomes the great shepherd. You understand? The good shepherd, he gave his life. And the great shepherd, the sacrifice has been accepted. And then the chief shepherd, he will be coming again. He's now the great shepherd of the sheep. He has now transformed the people. There are no more goats. There are no more wolves. There are no more ravenous, uh, ravenous uh, snakes. They are now the sheep of the fold of the Lord. He's telling us quite a lot in that verse of scripture that we are reading. A reconciliation has taken place. A transformation has taken place. We have now brought, we are now being brought into the family of God, into the fold of God. And all that he tells us came to be through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Let us look at this and understand that the coming of Christ actually produces peace and grants reconciliation between us and the almighty God. In Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Reading from verse 14. For he, he Christ, uh, and you will notice at the end of verse 13, by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. And immediately he mentions that blood of Christ. It says, for he is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments uh, contained in the ordinances, for to make in himself of twin one new man, so making peace there's reconciliation there is peace he's not angry against us anymore he's not our enemy anymore we're reconciled unto him there is peace between us and the almighty god in verse 16 and that he might reconcile both unto god in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace unto you which are afar off and to them that were near the gentiles that are far off peace is available. The Jewish people that were ceremonially and religiously near, peace was available also through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see here it mentions to you the blood of Christ because it is by the chastisement. It is by what was laid upon the Lord. We have this reconciliation. We have this peace. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgression. It's because of our transgression, because of our sin, that the punishment was laid upon him. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace. For us to have peace with the Lord, he had to be chastised. He had to be punished. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his tribes, we are healed. If you are there and this peace you have not experienced, and you are wondering, I feel guilty. I feel condemned. There is a burden of condemnation upon me and my conscience is troubled and I go about without any peace at all. In the morning, afternoon, night and evening, there is no peace in me. How can I have this peace? Very simple. In fact, Job tells us in Job chapter 22, Job chapter 22, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. It says, acquaint thyself with him. When you are far away from the Lord, there is no peace, says the wicked, uh, says, uh, uh, for the wicked, says the Lord. When you are far away from the Lord, there is a middle wall of partition between you and the Almighty God. Therefore, there is no peace. If you are going to have peace with God and peace in your heart, what do you need? You become reconciled with God. You draw near unto God. God. The enmity between you and the Lord is taken away. Acquaint now thyself with him, and you will be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. And then it says in verse 23, if thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, and thou shalt put away iniquity far away, far from thy tabernacles. That's how to have the peace of God when you put the sin away. 
and then your sins are forgiven. You are reconciled with the Lord. Things have changed now. You are no more what you used to be. The things you used to do that will trouble your conscience, you are not doing them anymore. Peace will come. The presence of Christ, the coming of Christ will bring peace in your heart. In Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27 and in verse 5. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Take hold of the strength of the Lord. Take hold of Christ. He is the one that stands between us and the Almighty God. He is the link. He is the Redeemer. He is the avenue or the means by which our sins are forgiven. The things that are bringing guilt and condemnation to our hearts is Jesus Christ that shed his blood so that everything will be taken away. Lay hold on the strength of the Lord, on Christ himself, so that you'll be able to make peace with him, and you will make peace with him. Then when your sins are forgiven, because of Christ, you are justified. Because of Christ, you are set free. Because of Christ, the condemnation is no more there, because the punishment of your sin has been laid upon him. That's why we're told in uh, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and in verse 1, it says, Therefore... Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not through going to church, that's not enough. It's not through doing good works. How about the bad works we've done before? Good works today, they are not enough. But because of Jesus Christ that shed his blood for you and for me. And as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing your sins to the Lord, asking for forgiveness, that just because of Christ, because of his sacrifice, the Lord should take away your sins and blot everything out. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And uh, through it is through our Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. And then after you are born again, you start walking in the will of God, in the word of God, in the way of the Lord. And because of that life of obedience, because of that life of obeying the Lord, following the word of God, that peace will continue. If you backslide, obviously, that peace is going to be disturbed. But when you are walking in the truth, you are walking in the word of God, the Lord is speaking to you, and you are saying, yes, Lord, and you are obedient every time, the peace will continue like a river. In Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, my covenant was with him of life and peace. You come into a covenant of peace with the Lord, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. He was afraid before my name. That is, you are afraid to offend the Lord. You say, no, I cannot do that. The Lord will not be happy at that. And when you are conscious of the presence of the Lord, of the word of the Lord, and you are careful, you don't want to offend the Lord, the peace of the Lord will continue. In verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his leaves, and he walked with me in peace. When iniquity is no more there, your sins are forgiven, your sins are taken away, then you find out that you'll be walking with the Lord in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. In fact, you become a soul winner. You begin to reconcile people with the Lord, and the blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. The people that are still at enmity with the Lord, you are telling them them, be ye reconciled unto God. And you are turning many away from their sins. You are turning them to the Lord, making peace between them and the Lord, and your own peace too will continue. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 10. Isaiah chapter 54 verse 10. For the mountains shall, shall depart, and the hills shall be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, and neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on thee. He had mercy on thee, he forgave your sin. And because you are now walking in righteousness, he says, there is a covenant between me and you. And it is a covenant of peace, it is a God of peace, Christ is the Prince of Peace. You now, you are the Son of Peace. You see, peace with the Father, peace with the uh, Son, and peace now with the child of God. And it's a covenant between you and the Lord. You continue to walk in peace with the Lord. Let's come back to uh, chapter 13 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. We're looking at verse 20 again. 
Here Paul the apostle, as we pointed out, he was praying for the people. And because he knew that they needed heavenly power, they needed divine power to be able to carry out and obey everything he had taught them in the epistle. How did they pray? Look at it, verse 20 again now. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Before we leave verse 20, it's very important for us to point something out. There is a God of peace. There is a peace of God. First of all, you become born again. You are justified by faith. And because you are justified by faith, you have peace with God. The middle wall of partition is broken down. The middle wall of separation, division is broken down. The enmity is taken away. The condemnation or what happened to Adam running away from the Lord because he had offended the Lord. Not fear is no more in you. There is peace with God. But there is also the peace of God. That leads us to point number two. The peace of God. This peace of God is coming from the uh, God of peace. You say, what's the difference between peace with God? And the peace of God. Relationship with God brings the peace with God. When you are born again, you are reconciled with the Lord, there is peace with God. But when you fellowship with the Lord, and you are intimate with the God of peace, that will now grant you the peace of God in your heart and in your life. Look at the PM Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. <coughs> In Philippians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 7. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, this is going beyond peace with God. Peace with God as reconciliation, but not the very peace of God. And the kind of peace that is so deep, the kind of peace that makes us so calm within, even in the midst of a troubled world, in the midst of a world that is that feel anxiety and worry, the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your heart and mind through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need in a world like this. You know what happens in your community? You know what happens in the place of work? You know what happens in the country in general? You know people are not having any deep peace, calmness within them. Them, but the people that know the Lord, as it appears to me on the face of the sea, deep within the sea, there is calmness and there is peace because of the peace of God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. It means that whatever the circumstances are, whatever the problems are, whatever the fire that may be burning in the external, outside world, deep within your heart, there is a peace that is there, that the world does not give on, and the world cannot take away. That peace of God, that is within you, it goes beyond the circumstances and the situations of your life. And whatever it is that may be happening in the family circle, it's deep in the heart and the external thing, situations and circumstances will not be able to disturb that peace or change that peace or remove that peace. That's why it says that peace of God will rule in your heart and will moderate everything going on within to the which ye also are called in one body. And it tells so that this peace of God is not an intermittent thing. That is, you have peace now, and then a few hours later, you don't have any peace. It says it's there all the time. In Second Thessalonians chapter three, Second Thessalonians chapter three, in verse sixteen, it says, "Now the Lord of peace Himself give you peace always." By all means, the Lord be with you all. It says, when the presence of the Lord is there, and you feel the presence of the Lord more than you feel whatever biting circumstances may be there, it says that Lord of peace himself will give you peace. And you see the word there always. That peace will be there in the family. The in-laws are making trouble, and you are so calm. And there is peace within, and nothing really dissolves you, and you are still able to go the way you ought to go, and do the things you ought to do because the peace in your heart and the peace in your life is not disturbed. How 
how can that be? Well, that comes to us or that happens to us because we fix our minds on Christ. You don't fix your eyes on the stormy sea. You fix your eyes on the Lord. You don't fix your eyes on the changing, disturbed uh, uh, circumstances around you. You fix your eyes on Christ. You don't fix your eyes on the persecutors and their persecution. You fix your eyes on Christ. Once your mind is stayed on Christ and you fix your mind on, on Christ, the God of peace will make the peace of God like flowing like a river to be in your heart. Isaiah chapter 26 and in verse 3. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace. That's a peace that goes beyond understanding. That's a peace that people cannot understand. That's a peace that people in your place of work and they're trying to make life difficult for you and they are threatening you that this will happen and that will happen and you are calm and you are peaceful and you know that your promotion is not in their hand it's in the hand of God protection is not in their hand it's in the hand of God your prosperity is not in their hand it's in the hand of God you know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord those who are called by his name you know that the Lord will perfect everything concerning you you know that your times and your desires everything you need you know it's in the hand of the Lord you know that the Lord is controlling all things until everything in your life is according to his perfect will because of that knowledge and because you are fixing your mind and fixing your eyes on him there's a calmness there's a deep peace within that none of those people of the world will be able to disturb it says thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is staged on thee because he trusted in thee i want to encourage you trust in the lord fix your mind on the lord and everything that uh, pertains to you the lord will perfect in jesus name we shouldn't allow the things that are happening in the world we shouldn't allow them to disturb our peace in christ there's peace for every child of god i saw chapter 32 Isaiah chapter 32 and in verse 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. You see what that means? Uh, the work of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness, the result of righteousness, the effect of righteousness in our lives. You know, when you are living according to the word of God and you allow righteousness to have dominion, you, have right, you want righteousness to reign in your life, it will bring peace. You don't do anything that gives you guilty conscience. Once there is any invitation, any kind of allurement of the devil, enticement to do evil, you know, you, know, you say, that's evil, I cannot do that, I cannot touch that, I cannot smoke, I cannot drink, I will not get into those things. The righteousness then, the work and the effect and the result of that righteousness will be peace. Look at the second part of the verse, and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and assurance forever. You see, it is a righteous life that makes us to be in peace. You you're not doing it. You have not done anything that you're afraid the police people are chasing after you. You have not done anything that you feel that uh, people are going to report. And when they report that thing, you may get into trouble. When righteousness is there, peace will be there. When righteousness is there, calmness will be there. When righteousness is there, the effect, the result, and the and the uh, and the work of that righteousness will be peace in your life. I pray that this peace will not just be moderate; it will be abundant in your life in Jesus' name. In fact. That is what the Lord himself has promised. He said that if we are walking with him, he will make the peace we have to be abundant. That goes beyond peace with God. That's not a limited thing, a moderate thing. It's something so great and so deep. It is the abundant peace of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 33. Chapter 33 and in verse 6. Jeremiah 33 verse 6. Behold, I will bring it health and cure. And I will cure them, and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. The abundance of peace and truth. You'll see the connection here. Truth is there, peace is there. And when truth increases, the peace will increase. When your life is lived more and more, according to the truth of the word of God, as the truth is abundantly evident in your life, 
peace will also be abundantly evident in your life. And as we come close to the Lord, and uh, we're intimate with the Lord, and we're always looking at the Lord, and we know that He Himself is the one that has called us. He is the Prince of Peace. You cannot be living with the Prince of Peace and not have peace. You cannot be intimate with the Prince of Peace and not have this peace of God. You cannot be so buried and embedded and immersed uh, in the peace, in the Prince of Peace, and not have the peace of God. The peace of God will be so much in your life, nothing will be able to take it away. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14, and in verse 27, Peace I live with you, my peace I give unto you. Uh, not as the world giveth it, give I unto you. You know, if you are depending upon the world, they will do something or you are happy, and the very next moment they can do something, they will, you will lose that peace. But it says, it is not as the world that's giving unto you. I give it unto you specially, and it is my peace. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we learn that as we continue with the Lord, and we commit everything in our lives into the hands of the Lord, you will have peace of the highest kind possible. There will be no anxiety because you know that you will order all things are right in your life. And it is only in Christ abiding in Him and His Word abiding in us that we can be preserved in such perfect peace. The storm, as I said before, may be raging on the surface of the sea, but in the depths of the sea there will be calmness and there will be peace. And then there is a so in our lives when the Prince of Peace is allowed to reign without a Rival. And when the God of peace himself fellowships with us without any disturbance, such peace abiding and abundant will come from him that has power to give that peace and make that peace that the world can never give and the world can never take away. Your mind, your heart, your conscience will all be at rest and will be at peace. In fact, this state of peace will continue even to the hour of death as long as you are fixing your mind on Christ, our Lord and Savior. How good and desirable is it for us to have such a peace in the world of care and anxiety. Let the God of peace be with you and the peace of God will never be missing your life in Jesus' name. But then, as he continues in the prayer, he now tells us something which brings us to point number three. We come to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to read verse 20 to verse 21. Actually, what we need now is verse 21. But we need to get the background to what is coming in verse 21 now. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, here is what he now wanted the Lord to do. What he wanted the Lord to do for the people who have Jesus as our Lord. They are born again. Christ is controlling them already. They are the children of God. Who have Jesus Christ as the shepherd of their soul. Because it says that great shepherd of the sheep. Who have tasted of the first work of grace that comes through the blood of the Lamb. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. After getting that peace from the Lord, there is still another thing that we need. So that we can live a life that is totally well pleasing unto the Lord. Verse 21 make you perfect. Notice that. That's something. One thing that he needs to do. Number two, in every good work. Not only that number three, to do his will. Number four, walking in you. That which is well pleasing. Number five, it is not only that it is well pleasing to your neighbors, not just well pleasing to you yourself. Number five, it is well pleasing in his sight. Number six, it is only accomplished. It can only be done through Jesus Christ. You see this? The Lord is able to do something in you and he works within you. That which is well pleasing in his sight and he works every good work and he makes to do is will in short he makes you perfect now whenever we mention the word perfect there are some religious people evangelicals in particular they hate that word but it's in the bible and they hate it because they don't understand they think that when we mention being perfect we're thinking of perfect in the head perfect in the heart christian perfection is not a perfect head it's a perfect heart 
There are many things that people who are sanctified that they don't know. That's why we're still coming to the Bible study. Our hearts are perfected, but the head is not perfect yet. And there are many things we don't know. That means that all we're talking about is being perfect in behavior, not perfect in knowledge. Another thing is, some people will say, I know those people who say they're sanctified. I have a lot of things against them. In fact, I can point to them that they're not perfect. Listen, we're not talking about being perfect before men. You know what? Jesus was not perfect before the Pharisees and before the, and before the Sadducees. He was perfect, of course, before God. He was perfect before his disciples. He lived a perfect life. But when the Pharisees looked at his life and the Sadducees looked at his life, oh, they said he's not perfect. We know that what he's doing, he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub. They didn't find him perfect, but Almighty God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The perfection we're talking about is not perfection before the enemy. It's not perfection before the persecutors. Our persecutors will find him perfection, and the sinners who are wanting to criticize us, they will dig up something and say, after all, you are not perfect. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the work of grace. In the heart of a man, in the heart of a woman, that the Lord cleanses that individual and to God, in the sight of God. He is satisfied, I purified him, I have perfected him. And as I said, we're talking about practical perfection. Let me show you what I mean by practical perfection. In uh, First Kings, First Kings chapter 8 and in verse 61. First Kings 8 verse 61. Here we read in the word of God, let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. He said, you're doing well. Let it continue as at this day. That's the behavior we're talking about. That's the perfection you see there. He said, as it is this day is so perfect, do it tomorrow, do it the next day, repeat it next week and let that perfection continue as practical perfection in First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 9. First Chronicles chapter 29 verse 9. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly. Because with a perfect heart, they offered willingly to the Lord. That's a practical thing we're talking about. You worship the Lord. There is no resistance. There is no uh, reservation. You give yourself fully and completely unto the Lord. And then the Bible says, you offered willingly perfectly. That's the perfect uh, thing that the Bible is talking about. We're not talking about angelic perfection. We're not talking about the perfection we will get when we get to heaven. We're not talking of Adamic perfection. The kind of perfection that Adam had before the fall in the Garden of Eden. We're talking of what God does now and it just makes us to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And there is nothing within us that we are conscious of that is rebelling against the Lord. That's the practical perfection we're talking about in second uh, chronicles chapter 19 second chronicles chapter 19 and in verse 9 and he charged them saying thus shall ye do in the fear of the lord faithfully and with a perfect heart he said when you listen to the people that have problems make sure that you are not partial the person that is wrong you tell that person my brother you are wrong in this matter the person that is right you justify him and say you are right in this matter when you do that he says you are doing it with a perfect heart in psalm 101 Psalm 101, verses 2 and 3, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will thou come uh, unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. He's just talking about a relationship in your house with uh, the children there, in your house with your wife, with your husband. Just make sure that you do things according to the word of God, according to the light. That is what he's talking about. Uh, you say, but I cannot do that. You are not the one to do that. The God of peace that brought again Jesus from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect. It's the work of the Lord and it is the work of the Lord. He will do it and he will do it in our lives in Jesus' name. But if he's going to do it, does he use any means at all? Does he do anything or take some privileges that were given in the church so as to be able to do that? Oh yes, he uses something to do that in our lives. Ephesians chapter 4. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. You see that? The work of the leaders in the church. All the things the evangelists will be doing, the pastors will be doing, the teachers will be doing, the apostles will be doing, the prophets will be doing, they are to culminate in perfection in our lives. See in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Paul the apostle said, oh yes, you can be perfect, but then there is something God is going to use. He's going to use the warning and he's going to use the teaching. All the things we're doing in the church, you come to the Bible study, you come to the Sunday service, you listen to the word of God, you listen to the Bible reading, you see the challenging examples of your brothers and sisters and you say, oh, how I wish I'll be like this, my brother. How I wish what God has done in this sister, he will do it in me. God uses the teaching, the warning, the exhortation the examples, the encouragement to lead us into that perfection. And then we're told in, uh, for, in this Colossians chapter 4 and in verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. You see that? As we pray for one another, you are praying for me, I am praying for you, and our other leaders are praying for each of us, and what are they praying for? They are saying, oh Lord, whatever still needs to be done, do it in the life of these our brothers and sisters, so that they will be perfect in Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading verse 17, but I'm going to start from verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. You see that? The reading of the word, the teaching of the word, the doctrine of the word, and uh, the correction in the word, the instruction in righteousness in the word, all that is to lead us to perfection. It will make you discover what you don't have yet, which you ought to have, and it will show you the promise of God, and you take those promises of the Lord to the Lord in prayer, and that is to lead you unto perfection. And then in First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It says here, For uh, what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith uh, we join. Uh, for your sakes before our God in verse 10 night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith Paul the apostle said we're laboring we're praying we're interceding we're wrestling in prayer for you you know why we're doing that we're doing that so that anything that is still not perfect in you will perfect your faith so you will see from all these things that we're learning that it is possible in fact what we're talking about is not an idealistic kind of prayer. It's not an idle prayer. It's not an impossible prayer that God cannot answer. And in fact, he says, he will do it through the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the everlasting covenant. We need to know that this God, the God of peace, who is the author of the peace and the source of peace, is the one who has made adequate, abundant provision in the new covenant to make us pure and to make us perfect. God has the power to make us perfect. Doesn't he have the power? And then he will make us perfect in every good work. And it's not difficult to live only a day at a time. You wake up in the morning and you say, Lord, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for that sanctification. I want the salvation, the sanctification to be a practical fruit today. And as I go out, any temptation, any problem, any contradiction, let your work in me be revealed and manifest that I'll be able to confront all those things that will happen to me today in the will of God. That those things will not take me away from the center of the will of God. I yield myself to you. I surrender myself to you so that you will be walking in me that which is well pleasing in your sight through the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he's able to do it and he will do it for every one of us in Jesus name. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and in verse 11, here he tells us, Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. As uh, we close, we need to remind ourselves that if we will allow God to do it, this sin will be done in Jesus' name. 
May the Lord God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you perfect. Perfect in every good work. In every good work to do his will, may he walk in you. That which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. I pray that your life would always bring glory unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I'm praying the same prayer. Paul has prayed that prayer for us already. The Lord himself is praying for us. If there is any imperfection in your life, you know your shortcoming. You know your weakness. You know what is not actually right in your life. You can bring it before the Lord and say, Lord, didn't you say, be ye perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect? Do it in my life. Do it in my life. He will do it for you. Look at your relationship in the family. Look at your relationship in your place of work. Look at your relationship with your neighbors. Look at your interaction with uh, fellow brothers and sisters in the church. Look, the Lord wants to do something great in your heart tonight. He wants to perfect you. Perfect heart. He wants to give you peace in your mind. The peace that passes understanding. He is the one that will do it. You don't need to struggle. You don't need to fight for it. It's the Lord himself. He will make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And he will walk in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. The Lord is so powerful. He raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That same power can walk in your soul, walk in your heart, walk in your mind. He will make you perfect. Let go and let God do it.